I have never been to Calcutta. I, neither have I ever kicked Mother Teresa in the shin. I'm definitely glad to be here. I want to start off by thanking the elders for the opportunity, thanking the uh, Brother Dilbeck, Brother Hafner, and Brother Chavaria for all that they do, the deacons, and each and every one of you that is here. I also want to thank all of those that are, were influential in my lesson. Although there are too many to mention by name, I read a lot of sermons, a lot of articles, a lot of books in preparation for hope and hopelessness. And so I want to thank all of those that attributed to, uh, to our lesson this evening. There was a man that came to my office about seven in the morning. He had his head down. His shoulders were a bit slunched. His body was crouched. And he stood with his Bible in his hand, although you could tell he hadn't opened it in quite some time. I opened the door. I let him in. He dragged himself into my, uh, into my office. He slumped himself down on the chair and he let out a long sigh. <sighs> I remember watching him as he melted, like one of those old Salvador Dali paintings, into my chair. And he looked up at me and he said, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point in going on with life? What's the point in doing anything? I sit at home and I do nothing all day, all night. This man's not real. But we all know a man like this. I've had people who I've talked to who have this same mentality, this same heart, this same passion for practically sometimes nothing. And I remember thinking sometimes how I would approach an individual who came to me and told me I have no hope, or I am hopeless. And I'm reminded of a classic novel that I read as a child, Alice in Wonderland. There's a scene in the book Alice in Wonderland in which Alice comes to a fork in the road. In one direction, she can go one way, and the other direction, a complete and different way. And she sits there and she ponders for a moment, thinking to herself, which is the direction that I should take? And she asks for a little bit of help from the Cheshire cat. And she looks and she says, cat, which, direct, excuse me, which direction should I take? And the cat looks at her and says, well, that would depend on where you want to get to. And she said, I care not where I get to. And the cat responds and says, then it does not matter which direction you go. It's unfortunate, but a lot of people have this same mentality. A lot of people have this same idea or ideology. They have this same attitude as Alice. They have the same attitude as Howard, the hopeless. This idea that they don't care where they come from, where they are at, or where they are going. Many people don't know where to place their focus in life and are unsure what their purpose in life might be altogether. A healthy human being lives every moment in three time zones. The past, the present, and the future. We know the past through memory and history. We know the present by observation, by listening, and reflection. And we participate in the future by anticipation, either dread or hope. If a person is lacking any of these areas, we become alarmed. If one cannot remember the past or is indifferent about it, something is amiss. If one cannot or will not perceive the present, we say that that person is out of touch with reality. And if this goes on for too long, it can truly become a problem. And if a person has no hope, does not anticipate the future with some sense of purpose or goal, we know that despair and meaninglessness cast a dark cloud over that life and those related to it. I want you to open your Bibles with me this evening. Psalm chapter 33, or excuse me, Psalm 34, 17 through 20. Psalm 34, 17 through 20. 
as we embark on this study of hope and hopelessness, as we envision those people sitting across from us in our offices or in our homes, those Howards, if you will, those that believe that they have no hope, we need to remember verses like Psalm 34, 17 through 20. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will save the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Listen to that first part. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. We go then to 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13 where it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And then finally, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We sometimes forget how important it is to have hope. How important it is to not allow dread to enter into our lives. And this lesson about hope and hopelessness I want us to think about the following questions. What happens when we deny ourselves hope? When we refuse to accept that hope is present because of the things that we've done or haven't done in our lives? What happens when hopelessness takes control of our life and threatens our very salvation? Author Morris Ashcraft, one of the books I happened to find on hope, I opened it up as when, when Brother Dilbeck called me and asked me if I would speak in the summer series. I went to my library, and the very first book I found was his on Christian hope. And I opened it up, and this was the very first section that I, that I read. In all human experiences, we have hope. During the worst illnesses, we hope for improvement. During the worst disasters, we hope that all will not be lost. Even the drawings on the walls in Auschwitz and Buchenwald reveal traces or glimmers of hope. Even in despair, the opposite of hope, the human spirit finds a small window through which to look with faint hope. When death takes the one nearest and dearest, our souls look beyond to a time when we shall meet again. Those whom I have known who knew that they were dying expressed a calm assurance that even in this departure, they looked forward to an arrival on the other side. And then it was this next sentence that crafted the rest of my, my lesson. Where there is no hope, hell already reigns. Where there is no hope, Hell already reigns. Sometimes the smallest bumps in life, sometimes the smallest storms in life can cause us to find ourselves at a position or a, a, a part of our life in which we feel as if we have no hope. Even the smallest thing as losing our job, although to some that may be enormous, for others it may be something small. Losing our job, not getting the promotion we thought we were promised. Losing a friend, moving away. Sometimes the smallest and most intricate of things that happen within our lives can cause us to feel empty. And the problem is, is when we allow ourselves to become empty, we allow for the world to fill that emptiness. We can't allow ourselves to lose hope. Because I'll tell you this, each and every one of us here, whether we believe it or not, has hope. If you can take two fingers and you can place them on your neck or place them on your hand and you can feel your heart beating, if you can take the breath of life each and every morning, if you can experience the wonders of creation around you, you have hope. 
It was Sherman during the Civil War who uttered the famous phrase, war is hell. It's not. Although war may be difficult, although war may be trials, uh, troublesome, there may be trials within war, it's not. It's not like hell, because even in war, there's hope. There's hope for victory. There's hope for a safe return home. There's hope that we'll see our families once again. The definition of hopelessness is being without God. Sometimes we make mistakes in our lives that impacts our hope. We feel as if God will never forgive me, or I've done so much wrong in my life that there is no hope for, in heaven for me. I talked about that man that came into my office. I use that as an illustration in order for us to understand that it can happen to each and every one of us. A family member, a friend can come to us in a time of need and despair and dread, finding themselves at a moment in their lives in which they've lost hope. More times than not, I've had people with this attitude. I've done so much wrong in my life. That there is no hope for me. I've done so many things to so many people. I have made people cry. I have made people bleed. I have made people hurt. There's no hope for me. God cannot forgive me. It wasn't too long ago that I was introduced to the Bible series on the History Channel. I didn't get very far into it. I had a hard time with Noah being Scottish. But there was one thing that I did notice as I was watching it, that I wished that those in the media or those in the, the entertainment industry would have done a little bit better of, is to highlight the times in which those Bible characters fell short. You see, all too often, we look through our Bible and we flip through those pages and what do we see? Superheroes. That's the way media wants to portray them, as superheroes. We see them faultless and perfect, but they weren't. Noah, David, Paul, Peter, all at one point in their lives found themselves lower than low. Found themselves in a position where they could have lost all hope. And yet what we see is that even those men, even those men found themselves with hope, looked forward to the future, did not allow for the things they had done to impact their present and have them forget about their future. Paul actually called it a thorn in his flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. Although we're not privy to the information at exactly what that thorn was, he doesn't say exactly what it is that is affecting him, that is keeping him from, um, from feeling as if he's conceited. He calls it a thorn in his flesh. But I want us to think back to Paul's life for just a moment. And I want us to remember that it was he who held the coats as Stephen was being stoned. It was he who made the declaration that he was going to search for those Christians or those believers in God and bring their lives to an end. That was Paul. And so for, each, for any of us today, tomorrow, or in the future to tell ourselves that we have no hope because of the things that we've done, I pray that you open the Bible and you read about the human beings in there that you read about their good and their faults. I guess the best thing for us to do is to start by defining hope. What is hope? What does it mean to have hope? If a man walks into your office or somebody walks up to you at work or somebody knocks on your door, or perhaps a family member, or maybe even at school, somebody comes up to you and they say, I do not have hope. What is it that they are lacking? Or is it, what is it that they feel that they are lacking? Hope, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. That's hope. 
a feeling or expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me. We're going to go to several verses uh, in the remainder of our lesson here. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. Romans chapter 8, 24 and 25 says, For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for what hopes for what is sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So what is hope? Hope is the things in which we cannot see. Hope is the things in which are in our future. Or heaven is our Christian hope. Hope is not something that we have already obtained, but rather something that we wish to obtain. That is hope. Okay, perhaps Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, let's actually back up just a tiny bit. We'll start in verse 18. What then? Only in every way, whether it be pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's hope. Hope is having the feeling that we, no matter what we are doing within our lives, if we find ourselves being persecuted by the world, somebody in the world looking at us and telling us that because we are Christians, we deserve to be punished, we deserve to be tortured, we deserve to be killed, that we know that there is something better waiting for us. That is hope. He uses the phrase, the word there, hope is to have courage in Christ. Ralph Waldo Emerson has one of the greatest quotes on courage. He says, whatever you do, you need courage. Whatever course you decide upon, there is always someone to tell you that you are wrong. There are always difficult arisings that tempt you to believe your critics are right. To map out a course of action and follow it to an end requires some of the same courage that a soldier needs. Peace has its victories, but it takes brave men and women to win them. He talks here within his quote about what it means to have courage. And I think that you can switch that, that, that word there within his quote to hope. You can read that quote again, and you can define hope within it. Whatever you do, you need hope. Whatever course you decide upon, there is always someone to tell you that you are wrong. There is always difficulties arising that will tempt you, tempt you to believe that your critics are right. To map out a course of action and follow it to the end requires some of the same hope that a soldier needs. When we as Christians develop within us hope, we create our map. We create a map that basically tells us exactly where we are going. And it doesn't matter what the outside world says. It doesn't matter what the denominations say. It doesn't matter what our friends or our family say. When we develop a strong uh, spiritual Christian hope. Our map is laid out before us. It's not written in pencil that can be easily erased. It's not written in crown that with the heat it'll melt away. It's not written in dry erase that with your hand you can make it disappear. It's written in permanent marker. It's written, it's chiseled into stone. Our map is laid out for us when we have Christian hope. And you know what it looks like? One line headed in one direction, and that direction is towards heaven. That's it. That's what it means to have hope. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 calls a gift from God hope. 
a gift from God. We oftentimes will hear preachers say that salvation is a gift laid down at our feet. I imagine when I was a child come Christmas morning, my, um, my parents, we had an alarm system on our house. And before we added the addition to our house, the second you stepped into the kitchen coming down from the, the upstairs, the alarm went off. Didn't take very long for my brother and I to try to figure out Christmas morning how we could get to the tree without tripping the alarm. It was difficult, but it was possible. What it took was a really big jump to the table, from the table to the couch, and then you could sit there. Ask me how many times I was successful. None. It's about eight feet from the stairs to the, to the table, but it's a gift. That's what hope is, given by God, laid down at our feet. It sits there with our name, perfectly packaged. What does it, what do we have to do with it? Open it. We have to accept it. See, the problem is, is that for the majority of the world, for the Howards, the hopeless, they don't accept the fact that hope is there. As a matter of fact, the, the, the idea that they are hopeless can easily be washed away if they would just accept Jesus Christ into their life and open up the gift of hope. Proverbs 10.28 says, Hope is living a life full of joy, happiness. So what is hopelessness? I ran into a, a, a man today named Howard. And he is hopeless. So what does that mean? Somebody comes to us and they say, I'm hopeless. What are they? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. Start in verse 11, actually. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What does it mean to be hopeless? Read that verse again, verse 12. Alienated from the commonwealth. Israel are strangers to the covenants of promise, without God in the world. That in itself, if it is not highlighted or underlined in your Bible, you want to talk about how to help people if they come to you and they tell you that they are feeling as if they have a life without hope, you need to have this verse ready. Because to say I have no hope is to say that I have no God. That's what it means to be hopeless. To be alienated from the commonwealth to be separated from the, uh, the covenant promise, to be in a world without God, that is hopelessness. Job 14, 7 through 12, and again, 18 through 22, he talks about how hopelessness is equivalent to death. And I want us to turn there, because when, when Brother Dilbeck called me, asked me if I would speak today, I started thinking about hope, hopelessness. And I remember thinking about Job. And I remember thinking about the life that he lived. And I remember thinking of these verses, for there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grows old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low, Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake, and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again, till the heavens are no more. He will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. And we want us to go to verses 18 through 22. But the mountain fail, excuse me, the mountain falls and crumbles away, and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones, the torrents wash away the soil of the earth. So you destroy the hope of man. 
You prevail forever against him and he passes. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he perceives it not. He feels only the pain of his own body and he mourns only for himself. What does it mean to be hopeless? We talked about it being without God. The only time we are ever without hope is when we are without God. And what is the only time we are ever without God? When we live unfaithfully and we die unfaithfully. I'm reminded of the rich man in Lazarus, Luke 16, 19 through 31, when he begged for mercy. He begged for just a drop of water to cool his fiery tongue. He begged for someone to teach his family the truth. He begged for hope. And yet he is not given it. Why? Because if you want to talk about hopelessness, then we have to talk about hell. That is, is at that point when I realized the lesson that Brother Sam had given me. To get up and to talk about hell. To reference the fact that it is the only place that we as human beings are without hope. The only place that we are without hope. Because it is the only place that we find ourselves without God. Ecclesiastes 9, 4, and 6 reference hopelessness as death. Isaiah 38, 18 talks about no hope where in death. As far as I can see, each and every one of us that is looking up in this direction and is breathing, whether we believe it or not, have hope. Sometimes we allow our past, though, to dictate our hope. Sometimes we feel like we've living such evil lives that there is no hope for us. We feel that dread and we feel that guilt. We feel that anxiety. When people come to us and they tell us that they don't see how God could forgive them of the things that they've done, we not only remind them of the, of the Pauls and the Peters, of the Noahs and the Abrahams, those that had such great faith and such great hope, but yet were still human beings and made mistakes. We not only remind them of that, but we also turn to them and we give them those examples found within the Bible of hope. We look at Deuteronomy chapter 31, 5 and 6, where it tells us that God will not leave us or forsake us. So if we look back for a moment, what is hopelessness? It is being without God. Deuteronomy tells us in 31, 5, and 6 that he will not leave or forsake us. Hebrews chapter 13, 4, 5 says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Psalm 73, I am continually with you and I guide for you. Psalm 41 tells us you set me in your presence forever. If hopelessness is being without God, but God tells us that he will never leave us or forsake us, then we can never be hopeless. It's not possible. And even though we may feel as if there is no way for us to go forward, there is no way for us to move on, there is no way for us to continue in this life or to continue trying. Although we may at some point look in the mirror and see Howard the hopeless looking back at us or perhaps a family member, a friend, a child, a loved one telling us that they're hopeless, we can assure them that the Word of God tells us that we have hope. That it is always there. That it is a gift from God that it's ready for the taking if we are willing to accept it. And that there is only one place in which we cannot have it. And that's hell. No matter who we are or what we may believe, God is always present in our lives. But it is our free will that dictates whether or not we choose to obey him and whether or not we choose to obey his commandments. 
that being understood, no matter how bad our life may seem, no matter how uh, the sins that we might have committed, hope is always available. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4. I want to give you a few verses that you can use to show people that hope is always there. Even in the darkest of times and the most difficult of times, if someone comes to you and they tell you, David, Sam, Andy, I have no hope. We can show them these verses. You may have three preachers here, but you have a congregation full of ministers. People who can minister to other people. People who can teach other people who can help other people. And I want you to remember these verses, Romans chapter 4, verse 18. In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. This verse is talking about Abraham. We think back to Genesis and we think about the life that Abraham lived when God told him to go and he got up and he went. We think about all that Abraham did. And we think about what he established. We think about the fact that he truly is the father of many nations. Abraham had his faults. On more than one occasion, he lied about who Sarah was. When God told him that he was going to have a son, he took it upon himself to have that son, but not with Sarah, whom God told him he would have it with. And yet, what does he have? Hope. He always had hope. And hope, he believed against hope. That he should become the father of many nations, as he has been told. And it was fulfilled. Isaac was born. Abraham had hope. 1 Samuel 30. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses... 1 through 6 says, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day the Amalekites had made a raid against Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. His people have lost everything. And yet, where do we find David? Verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of, strong, spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and his daughter. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Hope. Even when he felt as if he lost everything, he never lost hope. Hope in the Lord. Strengthening himself. I'm also reminded of Job. In Job chapter 1, when we're told uh, when Satan goes to tempt Job. And what does he do? But he takes away not only his earthly possessions, but he takes away his entire family. And yet Job... Never loses sight of God. Never loses sight of the Lord. Another example of hope. Proverbs 14 and verse 32 is another uh, great verse to mark down. Proverbs 14 and verse 32. The wicked is overthrown through his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge in his death. Hope. Hope. You know, when I was a child, I had many fears. I was afraid of spiders. I still am afraid of spiders. As a matter of fact, as I was leaving here today, there was a spider on my front door of my apartment where there is now a dent because I made sure that that spider wasn't there waiting for me when I got back. I'm not a big fan of spiders, but I had another fear. I had a fear of death. A lot of people have a fear of death. Why is that? Because they don't know what's going to happen when they die. 
They don't know where they're going to go or what their life is going to be like. They don't know what's going to happen or, or what's going to, to, to come of them. And so they begin to develop this fear just like I had. As a matter of fact, I held on to that fear of death all throughout my childhood, all the way up until I was in college and I became a Christian. And even after I was a Christian, I still had a fear of death until I realized something. That those who obey the word of God, who follow in his commandments to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and become a member of his church, and they live faithfully when they die, they start to live. And then my fear of death went away. To not have a fear of death is to hope for what is going to happen and what is going to come when we die. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what struggles, no matter what trials, no matter what issues that are coming upon us when we have hope we know that whatever happens there will be a day in which we get to see heaven with the time that we have left I want us to look at a few things what we can rejoice of when we have hope what we can rejoice in when we have hope. Hope produces life. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Hope produces life. You know, I want you to imagine a society of young people growing up where they are told that 50% of them would not complete school. It's actually more realistic than just an imagination. This is actually a, something that goes on around the nation today. People constantly dropping out of school. But I want you to imagine for a moment that one day someone comes along and says that everyone that completes high school, that their college would be financed completely wherever they wanted to go. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? All I have to do is finish school and then you'll pay for my college? Can you imagine what it would be like if a situation like that were true? How many of those young kids would work hard to ensure that they completed college? Why? Because they had something to look forward to. Someone's going to pay for my college. Someone's going to take care of what I cannot. That's hope. It produces life. It gives us a reason to keep going. It gives us a reason to keep trying and to keep fighting. The hope we have in Christ gives us something to live for. Some other verses you can reference, Romans chapter 15, 14 through 13, and Romans 4, 18 through 20. Another thing, hope prospers life. Lamentations 3, 25 through 26, and Romans 8, verses 24 and 25. And I'm going to read that, Romans 8, 24 and 25. And it says here, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Prosper's life. When we have a hope, especially as Christians, when we hope for heaven, when we hope for that everlasting life, when we hope for what is to come past our death, our life prospers. Because we live our lives in the in a way in which we know there is something greater. Okay? Hope purities life. It changes how we see ourselves, 2 Peter 1 and verse 13. It changes what we value. When we allow for our lives to be filled with hope, when we hope for what is to come past death, when we have that Christian and spiritual hope, we begin to become people who value the word of God, rather the world of man. We begin to realize that if there is something greater, I'm going to do everything in my life to ensure that I can accept that greatness. That's what hope does. Because when you have hopelessness, you have nothing to look forward to. You have nothing to try for. 
1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27 through 27 tells us to run the race with a purpose. To, to run the race with a purpose. What is that purpose? To, to achieve that crown. And then finally, hope is rewarding. It gives us joy, Romans 15, 13. It gives us security, Psalm 33, 18. It gives us strength and courage, Psalm 31, 24. It gives us endurance and comfort, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And it gives us confidence in our ministry, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. When we can teach people about hope, when we can teach them that there is something greater, the sky's the limit. There is always going to be something in our life that shakes the very foundation that we walk upon. There are going to be times when the storms of our life become so great that we feel that we can't go on. At some point in our life, we're all going to be called Howard the Hopeless. But we need to remember that no matter how we felt, what we've done, we have hope available. There will be no satisfaction in being right about hell. I'll tell you that much. There is no satisfaction in knowing that hell exists. But there is a satisfaction in knowing that if I have hope, that I won't be there. That if I have hope and I obey the word of God, I follow in his commandments and I die faithfully, Revelation 2 and verse 10, I can have hope that I will not be there. It is at that point where we accept and obtain the great hope that we have been talking of. Don't choose hopelessness when God so openly tells us that hope is an option. I thank you for your time, for your attention. And I hope that each and every one of us understands that it doesn't matter who we are or who we've been.